Today we're going to be solving a trigonometric equation. It's this one that you can see right here and I actually solved this exact question a few days ago in my class and left that experience a little bit dissatisfied because the method that I know I'm comfortable with and that most textbooks recommend um, I know is actually pretty confusing and um, this is what it looks like for those of you who haven't seen it. You start with this question here and you have to uh, modify the domain that's been provided. So this is the domain uh, that gets stated in the question but in order to translate that domain into something useful for solving the question you kind of have to muck about with it a little bit um, and then you use your knowledge of normally solving trigonometric equations to get some angles um, and then modify them and you end up with these two solutions out the end. But it is far from intuitive, it's a pretty challenging method and one of the things that I offhandedly said during that lesson was there are other ways to solve this question. Now I stand by using this method. Um, I think that it's worth wrapping your head around and if you get it explained to you a little more slowly you can actually see how the pieces fit together more comfortably. But I am going to show you another way of doing this um, because I looked at this question more closely and I realized it had some particular characteristics that mean you have access to a bunch of different tools that you can use to solve it. Now it's not the way that I would recommend, uh, particularly for an advanced student because you actually need some extension one techniques to do it. Um, and I, even if you're an extension one student, I would recommend that you do it the other way because this is, as you'll see, a much longer way to do it. And because it's longer and it uses a lot of different knowledge, um, that also makes it more error prone. But it is one of the most important things in mathematics to know you can solve one problem in multiple different ways. That's kind of um, sometimes what you gain insight from. You look at the same object from more than one perspective um, and then it helps you understand that object. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna tackle this particular question um, using two extra techniques. Number one, um, we're going to think about this using some trigonometric identities that we have access to through the extension one course. Um, and then we're going to have to deal with a quadratic equation. You might look at this question right now and think, where is the quadratic equation in here? Well, it will emerge and we'll have to deal with it. So, let's have a go at this together. The first thing I'm going to say is that I actually have access to um, a trigonometric identity that allows me to deal with um, the fact that this is what we call a compound angle. So, um, you've got sine, of, but then the thing that the angle being provided has um, lots of different pieces to it. There's the, there's the two multiplying by the x and then there's that pi on three which introduces a phase shift. So how can we interact with that? Well, the relevant trigonometric identity here is that when you've got sine of a compound angle like a plus b, so you can see two components there, um, you can expand that into sine a cos b plus cos a sine b and there are some nice uh, proofs for that that I've done before you can find on the internet. So if we use this result with our particular compound angle here sine of 2x plus pi and 3 what do we actually get? Well I'll just maybe I'll put this here so we can actually do it directly underneath. I can say sine of 2x plus pi on 3 is going to be equal to and then I just do a straight substitution where I'm viewing 2x as my a and pi on 3 as my b. So what we end up with is uh, sine of uh, 2x cos of pi on 3 plus cos of 2x sine of pi on 3. So this is the identity that I can use and because I'm solving an equation with this sine of 2x plus pi on 3 on it, what I can do is I can just use this whole right hand side and use that to substitute what I had on the left hand side. So let's get a copy of that. Apparently that is equal to a half and I'm solving with this particular domain from naught to pi. Now one of the attractions of this method that I'm about to show you even though it is much longer than the other way is that um, in the previous method I had to kind of deal with the um, domain restriction this naught uh, to pi restriction. I had to deal with it first and I had to deal with it in a way that makes you kind of think like well, why am I doing this? It's a bit counterintuitive. It does give you the right answer but it isn't immediately apparent why you're doing it. Now one of the great things about this method is you can leave that domain restriction right until the very end. We will address it afterwards and it will be much more common sense. It will sort of um, be reasonable why we're doing it at that point. For now though we've sort of created a mess right we've made this out of this uh, much simpler term um, this is expanded out but because the particular angle is involved 2x and pi on 3 um, I can work with each of those using more trig expansions which I'm about to write down in a second um, and also some of my exact values because pi on 3 I know what cos pi on 3 and sine pi on 3 are in exact terms. So how do we deal with this? Well 
couple of pieces. Uh, let's deal with the exact values first because then I can just start to um, evaluate them and it'll look much simpler. I've got this sine 2x hanging out the front and then cos of pi on 3 or cos of 60 degrees if you're more comfortable in that uh, frame of thinking, that's a half. So I've got that uh, evaluated, then I have cos 2x, sine of pi on 3 is root 3 on 2 and that equals a half. So immediately you're like, oh, this is already nicer because um, once I've evaluated those exact va values, I can double everything um, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and then I get rid of my fractions. So what that leaves me with, if I multiply left and right-hand side by two, I'm gonna end up with sine of two x plus uh, that root three, I'll bring it out the front, cos of two x, and because I've multiplied the right-hand side by two as well, I just get one. Okay, great, so I'll deal with my exact values. At this point, I now wanna think about, well, how do I deal with, how do I deal with these guys? Um, and with trigonometric identities, there are so many different paths you can take through this, but certainly for me, the most immediate one was to say, well, I know what sine 2x is, um, I have an identity for that, it's uh, 2 sine x cos x, and I can also do a similar um, replacement for cos 2x, there's another identity for this, which is cos squared x minus sine squared x. So both of these are the double angle identities that we learn in the extension one course. So I'm just going to do a straight substitution with each of these and see what I end up with. So I'm going to have uh, 2 sine x cos x over here. And then I've got my root 3 um, cos squared minus sine squared. and that equals one. Okay, let's get those equal signs a bit more. Whoopsie daisy, a bit more lined up because that's slightly bothering me. Okay, very good. So um, you can see what I've got here now is, um, well, I'm getting a quadratic. This is why I mentioned before, and I kind of knew I was gonna end up with something like this when I looked at the original question and I saw, oh, there's some double angle involved. So the identities that I'm most likely gonna be using lead me to um, this quadratic in, um, in a trigonometric function. So then what do I do with this? Well, our normal strategy is we want to get everything in terms of a single trigonometric identity. Right now I have sines and cosines flying around. And um, one of the handy tricks that we, um, we can learn is that if you divide everything through by an appropriate trigonometric identity, then you can turn all these sines and cosines into just a single kind of trig function. Um, and so what I'm going to do is even though it looks like, where did I get this from? I'm gonna divide everything through by cos squared x. You might wonder why I chose that. Well, it's gonna become very apparent once I actually do the division. So you can see I'm dividing every single term and you've gotta be careful you don't miss any. I'm dividing them all through by cos squared x and then let's see what we emerge or what we get at the end. So for starters, um, over here on the first term, you can actually see this cosine on the top will um, cancel with one of the cosines on the bottom. Um, you can see in the middle term you've got cos squared on cos squared, so you're just going to get one out of that. Sine squared on cos squared, I think we know what to do with that guy, and then we'll also have a, a reciprocal identity on the right hand side. So let's start to write the next line. So uh, 2 sine x on cos x, which is what you can see over here, that's 2 tan x, right? Then you've got uh, root 3, which is still there. We already decided that cos squared on cos squared will cancel. Sine squared on cos squared will give me minus tan squared. And then on the right-hand side, 1 over cos squared, the relevant reciprocal identity here is sec squared, okay? Now I need to pull in another identity at this point because you're looking thinking, wow, um, you created uh, an equation with two different kinds of uh, trig functions, tan and sec, um, but that's what you started with. You had sines and cosines before, right? Like, so how is this better? Uh, and the answer is using the Pythagorean identity, which is sine squared plus cos squared equals one. I can actually do that same trick that I just did, which is divide everything through by cos squared. And you can see that it creates a relationship, not just between sine and cosine, but the two trigonometric identities that I've ended up with, right? So you get here, um, from this identity, tan squared plus one equals sec squared. So you can see I can substitute that on the right hand side. So let's go ahead and do it. Uh, what have I got here? Well, nothing is going to change on the uh, left hand side yet. Actually, you know what? I can change this because I know I'm gonna go here eventually. I'm gonna expand out um, this, this little set of brackets here. So I'll get my two tan x hanging out the front. Um, root three times one is just the root three. And then minus root three 10 squared x. Okay, that looks good. 
And then over here on the right hand side, instead of sec squared, I'm going to write tan squared x plus 1, because um, you can see that's what I get out of the Pythagorean identity. So tan squared x plus 1. Okay, so you might look at this thinking, oh, it is a bit of a mess. That's true, but at least it's a mess that I can deal with because everything's in terms of a single trigonometric um, uh, term, which is which is tan, right? A trigonometric function, I should say. So all I need to do here is sort of um, tidy this up a little bit and then see if I can put it into a form that's easier to work with. So let's have a look. Um, I've got um, some tan squared terms. I'm going to highlight them here. So there's uh, that tan squared term and then there's that one there. Um, I also have, what's a good color? I've got a tan x term, so just a single tan x. And then I also have a constant term. Um, it's over here in the root 3, that's an irrational part, and then there's a, a 1 hanging over there. Okay, so you can see I've got a quadratic in tan x. I need to get everything on one side so I can deal with it. So um, what's the best way to do this? Well, I think to avoid negatives, what I'm going to do is I will add root 3 tan squared x to both sides. In fact, I want to get everything over here on the right-hand side. Okay, so what I'm going to get with my uh, tan squared x terms is tan squared x, there's the one uh, from there. I'm going to add the root 3 tan squared x, that's from here. Um, I want to get the 2 tan x term on that side as well, so I'm going to subtract 2 tan x from both sides, and then I'll subtract root 3 from both sides, so that will give me 1 minus root Three. So this is what I would actually get on the um, on the right hand side. I've run out of space. You can see there. That's why I've written it um, on in sort of in the middle. Um, but actually, what I end up with on the other side is is nothing. I've gotten everything together on on this right hand side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave that on the left, and I'm going to say it's equal to zero. Okay, great. So just to make sure you can see how I've done this, um, my constant term is hanging out here. My tan x term is there, there's minus 2 tan x, and then you can see um, my tan squared x terms are over here. So you can see how I've collected everything from the previous line. Okay, now to make things ultra clear with my quadratic, I can do one more step, which is just to clean up the tan squared and the tan and the constant term and just separate them out. So when I factor out, <coughs> excuse me, tan squared x, what I'll get is 1 plus root 3, and then I get a tan squared, then I've got this minus 2 tan x, that was a really messy n, let's rewrite that. And then, um, just to make it super obvious, I'm going to put this constant term, the 1 and the minus root 3, really are um, one number together. That equals 0. 